Acting Director of Mary Stem Trustees Limited. Namilala, you have the floor. Hello, good evening. Can we all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Damilola. Thank you very much you know, for joining us this evening. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us. So briefly, we would um, just open up this conversation with um, a short presentation from my end on the facts, fears, and fiction around estate planning. Yes, okay. I had a bit of a technical issue, but I'm fine now. Great, thank you. So, um, estate planning. Why, why the hesitation at every point in time when people need to take a decision to plan their estate? It's important that um, we discuss some of those things demystify um, the concept of estate planning. And, you know, let's talk through why we need to plan our estate, the many benefits of planning our estate, you know, so that um, our, ben our beneficiaries, you know, can maximize, you know, um, the assets that we're leaving behind them. Of course, we all know that debt is not the end. And Ambrose Bias uh, emphasized it. He said there remains the litigation over the estate. So it's not just about um, passing on, but you know, of course, what happens afterwards. Um, from several studies, we are aware that you know, uh, there's been a lot of hesitation when it comes to people planning their estate. The, um, about 70% of family wealth transference and, and, and business associations fail because um, several things are not put in place. Experts have also you know, projected that over the course of the next uh, 25 years, uh, using the US demography actually, that um, at about $70 trillion will be in motion. That is transferring from one uh, generation to the other. And you can imagine what it means if 70% of these assets are lost and become debt capital. Debt capital in the sense that if an asset is held, but it's not, you are not able to translate it into, into um, financially. An asset is, is, um, can be defined as debt if you, know, you can't um, utilize that asset. You can't, that asset cannot add you know, to the economy's benefits. So, and we all know, we see it around. We see real estate lying around. You know, there is no proper documentation. The owner, the original owner has, has, has died and it didn't pass it on properly. So the current owners, though they may have access to the property, they actually don't have um, the right documentation to help them, you know, leverage those um, assets, you know, for their own benefit. So many polls conducted different parts of the world have indicated that um, just about 50% of, of adult population have even written a will. And out of this set of people that have written a will, of course, the larger proportion are people that are above 50 years of age. It is clear that there's an apathy, you know, towards um, planning the uh, estate. And then we are wondering why. So let's look at the facts, the fears, and the fiction. I start with the fears. Why are we afraid? Why, why the hesitation to plan our estate? Debt is a big word. Uh, that's the D word there. Death, people don't like to talk about death. Um, there's this, this, this fiction that, you know, when you, when you talk about death or when you prepare you know, for death, then you are actually calling on death to happen. I've heard people say things like, um, why should I plan my estate now? Why should I write a will? I don't plan to die just yet. And you wonder, really, do we, it's, why do we think that um, planning our estate has anything to do at all, you know, with the extent to which we live or the number of years that we spend on earth? There's so many other things that we're worried about. We're worried about the cost 
some of us are worried about losing control. If I plan my estate, if I do this, if I do that, will I still be in control of my estate? You know, there are other fictions to it. Some people think that um, this topic you are discussing is for the older generation. I'm still in my 40s, so why do I need to plan my estate? No, that is an incorrect position. Some also believe that you only plan your estate just to take care of, you know, issues surrounding death. It's beyond death. Incapacitation is also an issue that we need to plan our estate ahead of. You know, imagine what, would ha what can happen. Someone is suddenly incapacitated. He has assets, but because the assets have not been thoroughly planned, he's unable to access it. The, the family members are unable to access it, you know, and they are in dire need of funds, but this person is incapacitated. We've had several stories around such all over the place. So it's important that we demystify, you know, the issue of estate planning. Broadly speaking, the, the concept of wealth management cuts across three um, dimensions. There's the accumulation phase, you know, of your wealth management, accumulating the wealth. When you set goals, when you save, when you begin to invest, when you gather, you know, assets together. And then you move on to the preservation state, stage. It gets to a point where beyond you know, accumulating assets, you begin to think of how to hedge your portfolio against risk, or how to beyond just trying to gather and, 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 and build up investments. You want to ensure that your investments are properly diversified and you know, they can last you um, for a greater part of your lifetime. So you are thinking of all the preservation strategies around managing your world. And of course, ultimately, the third level, which is a transfer. So now I said there's the growth, which is the accumulation phase, the preservation phase, and then the transfer phase. While many of us are very excited to talk about the growth phase, the preservation phase, we look the other way and, and play the ostrich, if you'll allow me to use that word, when it comes to transfer of our estate. We don't, we don't, we are not very intentional about how we should put our estate together in a manner that it can be easily transferred, you know, um, and, our, our, and our loved ones can access those assets when we are unable to function or when we are no more. What is an estate? I've been talking about estate planning, planning your estate. Let me quickly break it down. An estate is the total property that, an, uh, that a person owns, the total property that you own. So estate planning is pretty much, you know, arranging your wealth in an orderly manner such that you know you are able to transfer effectively those assets you know so asset planning is just you taking the luxury and the liberty of you owning the assets and then planning who gets what how they get it when they get it you know so you are the one making the choice as to who owns what because these are your assets these are things that you've worked for so you are not the court and not the government not some appointed uh, professional somewhere you know uh, should be taking that decision on your behalf you have the opportunity while you're very much alive and healthy you know to make a decision about who gets what within your estate and i tell you anyone can plan their estate you're 75 years old, old, you're 40 years old, you're 35, it really doesn't matter. What is most important is that you are an adult, you are above 18, and you have assets, you own properties, you own whatever it is that you own that is valuable to you, forms a part of your estate. So planning it is simply saying, I, Danilola, own XYZ assets, and I want these assets you know, if I'm no more, so be available to so, so, and so persons for their use. You know, it's as simple as that. It has nothing to do with your age. It's all about the fact that you have assets that you've accumulated. Why should you plan your estate? Like I said earlier, it's important that you have a say. You know, what happens to your, to, to, to your assets? What happens to the people that you're leaving behind? Who, for, for, for one reason or the other, may still be heavily dependent on you as at the time of passing. What happens to these people? You know, it's important that as individuals, we set up structures, you know, that uh, minimize conflicts. 
I've had people say things like, um, I have a very small family, um, one wife and two kids, and we are very jolly. There are no issues. So my, my folks won't have any issues managing my assets if I'm no more. Why, do you, why can't you just take a step further to ensure that that really happens? We have heard stories upon stories of families that have been torn apart you know, by reason of the fact that they couldn't agree on how to proceed with the estates, you know, of their, bene of their benefactor. We've had several stories, heart-wrenching stories of men and women who have worked so hard, built a legacy, you know, only for them to pass on. And then one, two, three years, the family is deep in, 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 in crisis because they can't just agree on how to move forward with the person's estate. I mean, you have several stories um, on that. I, I, I just won't want to mention names. We also have the, the story of, of a doctor who passed on last year, a very popular one at that. You know, and what that the family is heavily, you know, um, uh, in contention about as to who owns what or who will have access to what, because there was no plan in place. It's important that as, as, as adults, that we structure our assets. What do I have? What is the best option, you know, for me to pass on what I have, you know, to my beneficiaries? We also need to look at the peculiarities of our families. For some of us, we have children, we have young children. It just stop to imagine. I don't pray for you or I and I, but imagine that you sleep and you don't wake up and you have young kids, you have children who are in school and you have assets that you haven't planned for. They can't even access. It, it can, for some families, it's as bad as the benefactor passes on and there's even no money to pay the children's school fees. Not because the money is not available, but the money is not accessible because you know those are two different things. Let me quickly run through um, the rest of, of my presentation. There are several tools that are available to you and I you know, to plan our estate. You can plan your estate by leveraging a will. I will go ahead to still define what a will is. If you can use um, a trust, as an, as an instrument, you know, to plan your estate. It could be as simple as a power of attorney. It could be you just having what we call nominated fund. It could be you giving gifts, you know, a, a simple gift in survivors. There are several tools and there are several ways around it. Like they would say, there are several ways to skin a cat. What is a will? It's a simple document through which, you know, as an individual, you will direct on how your property, you know, should be distributed when you're long gone. It takes effect only upon the death of the testator. That is the person who has written the will. And who are the parties to a will? You know, the testator, that's the, 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 the person writing, you know, the will. The executor, that is, who and who are you appointing to take charge of um, administering that distribution that you have, you know, enumerated. And then, of course, the beneficiaries, who do you want to get what? That's simply what it will um, entails. For a trust, it's an arrangement whereby, you know, simple, uh, as simple as the word is, trust, an individual or a corporate entity holds property, holds assets on behalf of another. That's, the sim that's simply what the trust arrangement is all about. And of course, your trustees can be an individual, like I said, and it can be a corporate entity. So a trust simply entails you identifying what your assets are and defining who you want to have what. And the benefit of a trust is that if it's a living trust, which is a type of trust, it can you can actually begin to implement it while you're very much alive. It just helps you to see the different dimensions, things can, the, the, and the different dimensions to it and the different ways things can go and allow you to, you know, to, uh, to more, can I use the word experiment, you know, while you're very much alive. Pros of a will. A will gives you a testamentary freedom, you know, um, you are, you are point an executor who carries out your, your wishes and as you stated in the will, it can be amended, 
you know, um, at any point in time, as long as you're alive, and the will only takes effect when you're long gone. So um, when we're looking at the, uh, the challenges to a will, there's, there's a possible, there's possibility of it being challenged in court, you know, and we've seen several examples of that. We know of families who the, the siblings are in court, they are at loggerheads, because um, one party thinks that they have been deprived um, of unnecessarily, you know, from the will. One party thinks that, no, I don't think this will was written uh, by my, my, my late father, or someone thinks that, no, uh, I don't think he was of a sound mind when he was writing this will. I have served him, I have taken care of him. Ordinarily, under normal circumstances, he wouldn't leave me out of his will. And then you have all sorts of reasons why people, you know, uh, can contain their will in the court of law. But of course, in the course of the webinar, we'll discuss a lot more in, 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 the, uh, in details, um, some of the challenges, the benefits, and of course, the challenges, you know, to writing a will. Of course, a will is subject to probate, subject to probate in the sense that um, it's, you, it would be made available to the public, and um, there's a probate tax of 10%. You know that would apply to whatever assets that um, are being passed on to your beneficiaries through your will. Um, the benefits of a trust, um, straight up, it avoids probate because don't forget that you have actually passed on the assets to um, through the instrument of a trusted to your trustees. So your trustees are already holding the assets in trust. So there's no threat to that. There's um, at the point of passing on, you, you actually technically do not own those assets anymore. So it avoids profit. It also affords you the opportunity to manage it during your lifetime, um, making transfer to your beneficiaries um, very easy. Of course, there are challenges you know, to uh, a trust as well. The, the, the transfer process um, can be tasking. So you really have to uh, be sure that a trust arrangements suits your own interest so that you can you would um, you would be properly guided if you speak with a professional and then it can guide you. A trust can be expensive to execute also when you're looking at the cost, overall cost of transferring those assets. But generally speaking, what we advise is that take a good look at your situation and your circumstances. What are the kind of assets that you are holding at the moment? For some assets, it's easier to put in your will. What are more tax, more tax effective, you know, to um, to put in a trust. You can have a combination of both, a will and a trust. It just all depends on the overall size of your um, of your estate and um, what it is that you really want to um, um, address. So, for if, if if you have a complex family tree, uh, you have a wife, you have children, and you have children outside of wedlock. Or you have, you know, you, you could have a complex situation. Your case would be very much different from someone who has a very simple nuclear family. You know, so what we do in, uh, in Merchant Trustees is to sit with you, have a conversation with you, ask all those difficult questions. What exactly is, does your family tree look like? What, um, uh, how you structured as a family? And then what kind of assets do you have? And then we decide, we, we advise rather, um, what we think is best for you to do. There are several other options. So beyond straight jacket, um, will or trust, there are different ways you can combine both. You can have what we call a pauvre will, which is a will, you know, that allow you, you have a trust and a will, and then the assets that you have, you know, that you've identified in the will can, you know, be poured into the um, trust upon demise. But of course, this is still a will, so it doesn't avoid probate. You know, you can also have what we call a testamentary trust, which is a trust that only takes effect upon demise. You know, so like I said, a living trust is the one that takes effect while you are alive, but you can have a testamentary trust that only takes effect when you're long gone. And of course, that also does not avoid COVID. There are other ways you can, you know, just simply make a gift. If there's a pros and cons of making a gift to identify beneficiaries have been issued, you should also understand the nuances around making a direct gift. What if you make that gift and you know, the person predeceases you. What happens? You know, so you also have to understand that there are challenges to 
um, making a direct gift. But in all, we're having this conversation this evening because, um, because something is difficult or challenging doesn't mean it should not be done. Is it important to be done? Yes. Is it important that for you and I, we need to plan our estates, we need to um, on, document the assets that we have, identify our beneficiaries, regardless of, the, of, of our age, regardless of where you are in life now, it's important that you do that. And with a professional like nursing trustees, we can handhold you, you know, so that you can be well informed, confront the situation, take the right decision, and you know, you can just put your mind to rest, knowing fully well that you have sorted out the bit of your estate. And if anything happens at any point in time, you're fully covered, you have nothing to worry about. And when the call comes, at whatever point in time it is, you can actually rest in peace. I, I would leave, I'll, I'll end it here and um, hand you over back to Ifunaya so that we can jump straight into the panel session. I know that you have questions. You have several questions in your mind. Already we have questions coming in ever since we started the publicity for this webinar. We have received several questions ahead of the webinar. We'll, uh, the panel would, as much as possible, try to address you know, um, the concerns that you have. And even if we don't, address your specific concerns. Be rest assured, we're just a phone call away and email away. You can always email us and con contact us so that we can, like I said, and hold you to take this decision at the right time so that your family, your loved ones can truly you know, benefit from the legacy that you're building. Thank you very much. If and I, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Dami Lola, for that insightful presentation. It is beautiful to know that a lot of um, investors and a lot of professionals live their lives, work very hard for their money, only to pass on and then have their family members in bitter contention over their assets. Dear attendee, you do not have to be one of those people. As Damilola has told us, there are a lot of estate planning tools like will, trust, power of attorney, or nominated fund, and you can choose any of them in order to ensure that your assets go to the right beneficiaries. And that there are fewer court cases when you pass on in glory. All right. At this point, I'll be calling on Ibiza Labo and Felicia King to uh, turn on their videos as we begin to attend to the questions in our Q&A chat box. But before we go to that, all attendees, please check the chat box. You would see a link there to enable us reach out to you and help you plan your estate, kindly fill out the survey. Please click the survey link and proceed to fill it out even as we take your question. All right, the first question says, what is the tax implication of each of the approaches, will, trust, and so on? What is the tax implication of each of the approaches? Damilola, would you like to take the question, please? Oh, sorry, I forgot I was muted. Um, so straight off, um, if you write a will, um, it is subject to probate. And at that point in time, it is um, when the will, when the, the, the testator passes on, the will will be you know, subjected to probate and it would attract an automatic 10% tax. So there is an, an estimation of the total value of the assets in the will and a 10% tax goes to the government. So the states where you know, um, the will is um, is registered. The ten percent goes to that um, to, to to the authorities there. So that is a straight off tax implication. Um, the, the the issue with tax generally is that we know that taxes are attached to individuals from birth to death and beyond death. So you give birth to a child today. The moment you attach an asset to that child and there's benefits derived from that asset, whether by virtue of income or, or appreciation in value, that child 
we would pay taxes. So um, you can totally take away the issue of tax. But what you can consider is, what can you avoid? So if you have uh, near cash assets, for example, that you, can, that, that you can transfer to a trust, what you will incur is the cost of transferring to a trust. The assets ordinarily, because they generate income, the trustees even on your behalf will remit your tax, will pay tax on those assets, but you would have saved your estate from the capital tax that would have applied if you know um, if it was through a will that you are passing it on to your beneficiaries. I I, I hope I'm able to answer that. Um, yes, right. you have. That will like it well. So it's there great. are also, also there are other, there are other legs to it. There are other ways and means to it. You know, so people have thought, okay, okay. So how about me holding assets in the name of my company? You know, you should also understand that when you hold assets in the name of your company, and um, if you are, if it is an operating company, you will have to file your returns. You will have to pay taxes. So you also have to understand all of that too, and know that. Um, Estate planning is not tax evasion. It is just more or less trying to, you know, um, based on what specific assets you have, trying to maximize and you know, try to be efficient around your tax um, plan. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Damila. It is important that you mentioned to us that estate planning is not tax evasion. Okay. Mr. Victor is asking us a backup question to that initial question. If inheritance tax is payable in Nigeria, inheritance tax, is this payable in Nigeria? Okay, Polisha, would you like to speak to that? Okay, thank you. Once. Thank you, Ifnaya. Please confirm that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you okay. loud and clear. Awesome. So what is paid in Nigeria is called, like Dama just said, estate tax. That's what you expected to pay. Um, I know some other jurisdictions have um, like he asked, he inherited tax, but that does not apply here. What applies in Nigeria is just the estate tax that you pay to the um, government where the COVID is um, the bill was lodged and registered. That's it. Okay, Felicia, that is very clear. So estate tax is all that applies to your estate planning and to all the assets therein. All right. Femi is asking a question. For landed properties, must there be C of O before you can put it in a trust? For landed properties, must there be C of O before you can put it in a trust? Felicia, please help us out with this question. Okay, thank you, Claire. So yes, there must be a title. It doesn't have to be a C of O. C of O is just one of the forms conferring title upon individuals or people. So yes, it must be a registered title. So it can be a deed of, registered deed of assignment. It can be a certificate of occupancy. It just has to be a registered title in your name. Because you, as I'm last said in the presentation, estate is what you own. So if you do not own it, if you are not recognized as the owner, then you cannot transfer. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, you must have a registered title. C of O, deed of assignment, whatever sale, whatever um, instrument is being used, as long as it is registered in your name, the government recognizing that you are the owner, then yes, you can form part of your estate and then you can definitely um, deal with it as you deem fit. All right, that is very clear. You must have a proof of ownership before you can include your property in your estate, all right. The next question says, do I need to, okay, let's start from the beginning. The attendee says, thank you for the excellent and enlightening presentation. If my real estate properties are in the name of my spouse and I, do I need to include them in the will in view of possible probate tax at execution? Let me take it again. If my real estate properties are in the name of my spouse and I, do I need to include them in the will in view of possible probate tax at execution? If it's a lot, it would be nice to hear your voice. All right. Um, thank you. So um, if properties are in your name and that of your spouse, um, that can um, connote two things, whether the properties are owned um, jointly, is it a case of joint ownership, 
or um, it's a case of tenancy in common. But um, whichever way it is, um, I will say advise that um, you have a will and you put it in a will. And so one of the things you can do is that when you put it in a will, the beneficiary um, of that particular asset could then be that wife of yours, right? And then um, your, your wife too, would, it would also be advisable that um, she too puts a will together and the beneficiary is also you. So that in the event that anyone predeceases the other, um, you know that uh, the survivor would be the one to take benefit of that asset and survivor can do whatever they want to do with it um, later on. But in the event that it's a clear cut case of joint ownership, whereby both of you have absolute interest in the asset, um, if anyone predeceases the other, the asset automatically goes to, um, to the other person. But like I mentioned, to avoid um, issues um, like these, I mean, estate planning issues are not. Just put a will together, make your wife your beneficiary, advise your wife to also write a will and make you the beneficiary. So in that case, both, both ends are well tied. Thank you. All right, Ibidola, but it is very important to have both um, members of the team include themselves in their wills just in case to ensure that both ends are tied. Okay, that question is well answered. But then another attendee is asking, I think this question goes to Felicia, who said that there has to be a proof of ownership for the property that will be included in the investor's estate. So the attendee is asking, would you advise us to have a hard copy of proof of ownership? Or is a soft copy okay? okay. So is a soft copy okay, or should we go for hard copy? Okay, thank you for that. I don't, I'm not certain if, um, for instance, Lagos State, if it's issued in soft copy. I don't know what you mean by soft copy, hard copy. Um, when your title is registered, you're definitely given a hard copy. Are you saying it's scanned of that? And if you don't have a hard copy, um, you can also always apply for the certified copy of the document. So um, if I'm clear your question, you're asking if you can use a soft copy, like a scanned copy of that um, to put in your will. What we do, what it puts in the will is not the document itself. It's just a reference. So when there's a referral, say, um, land registered, for instance, at, as um, number dash, volume dash, in page this of the legal states um, land bureau. So that's those details that are needed. Um, so I don't see the importance here of um, hard or soft copy, but if at all you want to say, if you're going to confirm that ownership is yours, the title documents, soft or hard, would definitely bear your name and numbers, details of registration will be put on it. So that should suffice either way. But if you need a hard copy, you can always ap apply for um, certified true copy of the doc title documents. I hope that's clear. Yes, and our attendee has replied to say that the agent issued him a soft copy. So we advise I should apply to get your hard copy. It is better to have that. All right, Mr. Victor Osinde is asking if the estate tax, as we have discussed, is applicable to assets owned abroad? And how does one deal with estates owned abroad? Felicia, would you like to take this here? Okay, sure, thank you. So there's a process called resealing, right? Um, typically, let me start locally. If you have assets in Lagos, um, got in probate in Lagos or and then you want to go to another jurisdiction where another asset is, but there is no legal for instance, Ibadan. You always have an asset in Ibadan. There's a process called resealing, meaning that you just go to the probate registry of um, Ibadan and then reseal. They recognize it and they transfer. But for out of, out of Nigeria um, assets, it's kind of tricky. Yes, you should put it in your will. Yes, it is recognized. But the process of that resealing is different Per jurisdictions. So what to apply in Dubai might not apply in UK, or apply in UK might not apply in US. So those jurisdictions and their laws and their rules would then come into effect. But yes, it's very possible to add assets that you own that out of the country, but the resilient process per jurisdictions will differ when you get there. 
All right. Open um, first question. Yes, that does. That does. If it's a lot, but do you want to add something to um, this question about estate owned abroad? Okay, all right. Um, just a quick one. Um, in addition to what um, Felicia said about um, the different laws that apply, um, in the event that it's also it's in a Commonwealth country, um, it's, it could also be seamless because the law that governs resilient, the Probate Resilient Act, um, recognizes the resilient of probate where those are set and in a Commonwealth jurisdiction. Um, but again, if there is no mutual benefit from that Commonwealth jurisdiction, it may also be difficult to receive it. So ultimately, you should also always bear in mind that the applicable law in that jurisdiction may then come into play. That's just my addition to that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It'd be the lab, but that's a very helpful addition. Very, very helpful. If the assets are within a Commonwealth country or within Commonwealth countries, it's easier. All right, thank you very much for that beautiful piece of information. Okay, this question goes to Damilola. An investor here is asking, please tell me more about the nominated fund and its advantages. Please tell me more about the nominated fund and its advantages. Okay, so um, it's just very simple you are specifying a certain amount. So that is for, for, for cash um, assets. You know, cash is a, is a form of asset. Um, you are specifying, you know, this amount of money, I am nominating it to, you know, for the benefit of X, Y, Z, you know, and you have, you, you leverage. Hello, can you hear me please? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, Yes, you, you leverage your trustee, you know, to perfect that. Um, it does not, it, it's also so, as, as simple as an agreement stating that X amount of money should be made available to XYZ beneficiaries. That's just what the nominated fund is about. And um, this comes in handy when you think about someone with a significant as, um, estate um, who passes on and um, even he has written a will, and maybe for some reasons a trust, a living trust, does not suit, you know, his um, circumstances, and he's written a will. You know that we talked about um, the estate tax being ten percent. So imagine someone who has assets worth about two hundred million. Um, estimated, you know, ten percent of that is about twenty million. So at the point where the family is applying you know, to the, to, for a grant of probate at the registry, it means that they need to have 10% of that 200 million, which is 20 million there. And you'll be surprised that people, you know, families struggle, you know, to have this sort of money. They struggle because they, they, maybe the main, the, the, the person who passed on is the main benefactor in that family and they can't even put that money together. So, Nominating an amount of money, which of course will not be idle, it will also be invested in yield returns like the regular investment, but it has been nominated, it has been marked, you know, for a beneficiary. It comes in and for some people, they nominate, you know, such funds and they say it should be standby funds for their burial expenses, for immediate family expenses, so um, children's school fees will not be um, affected if I suddenly pass on or if, if I suddenly become incapacitated or one thing or the other. You would also realize that um, COVID, you know, uh, has opened up a lot of things. Uh, it has opened us up to, indeed, the frailty around life. You know, how people who um, had, were in good health, people who have access, you know, to significant assets and all of that have been cut short, you know, um, by virtue of um, COVID-19 um, illness. So, you know, it's, it has just given an opportunity for us to really reflect on what our priorities are and how are we taking care. If we indeed we love the people that um, we say we love and we know that uh, as it is, they are totally dependent on us or they are largely dependent on us, you want to be sure that at every point in time, without you having to worry about it, 
there's something that they've done that they put in place, you know, to take to take care of them, at least even if it's their immediate needs. And related to that, sorry, <laughs> related to the nominated fund, we also have um, college education trust. We have education trust that, um, so I, was, I mentioned some examples of trust, but I didn't, I left that out. So what if a, a college education trust or if any form of education trust is just you simply setting aside either a lump amount or making, um, um, making periodic payments into a dedicated trust account, you know, to the funding of your children, your beneficiaries' education. So um, it's a simple way, you know, to, it's sort of you nominating the funds for their education. So what you're trying to say is that it really doesn't matter what happens. At any point in time when I'm no more, um, these funds have been put in place specifically for their education and the trustee has all the instructions regarding their school, regarding the bills that come in from the school and all of that. And then they just you know, uh, seamlessly take care of that responsibility on behalf of um, the settlement. So I just thought to quickly uh, chip that in. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Damilola, for mentioning that because it leads us to the popular myth that when you talk about estate planning or will writing, that you're talking about death, which probably draws closer because you're writing your will. We'll get to answering that question, but this goes to say that that is not true, all right? And if you're so worried about will writing, go ahead and create a living trust. Set up a child education trust, like that Milola has just told us. Set up a living trust for yourself and your loved one. It is very crucial. And that said, Suze Orman, who is an American financial advisor, a very seasoned one, has a popular saying that estate planning is an important and everlasting gift you can give to your family. So when you're thinking about leaving something behind, you want to leave behind a family that is at peace. For that reason, you set up your estate. You plan well. You do not want to leave behind chaos as you're being laid to the ground in the very far future. All right, talking about estate planning, please go to the chat box. Our link is right there for the survey. Kindly click the link. Give us some details. Let us help you plan your estate today. Do not put it off till tomorrow. Let's start right now. All right, so to the next question by Mr. Um, I think Mr. Omari. Mr. Omari is asking this question. Can one terminate a trust arrangement due to poor performance? Can one terminate a trust arrangement due to poor performance? If you do would you like to take the question, please? Yes, <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> you can terminate um, the trust arrangement for um, varied reasons, right? And um, in, a, in a standard trust deed, you always have a clause um, that gives you that right to terminate, right? Um, but one important thing to note is that if you have Maritime trustees as your trustee, it won't even cross your mind to terminate your trust, right? So, um, but yes, you can always do that. But rest assured that with the right hands, um, your asset is secured, your beneficiaries will reap the benefit that you tend um, that they benefit. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ibizola. But And to add to what he has just said, of course, you know that Mary Stem is here to serve you and we are your preferred financial services firm. So with us, you would have no need at all to terminate your trust because of poor performance. We are top-notch and we will always give you top-notch services. All right, the next question from Mr. Victor. Mr. Victor is asking, I think this one will go to uh, for Lucia. He says, how can one deal with disputes arising from forgery of wills? How can one deal with disputes arising from forgery of wills? Okay, thank you, Funaya. Um, forgery of wills, it's... <laughs> I don't know how, um, that's not very common, but there's a good part of it. When you write a will, right? Um, a copy of that will is supposed to be lodged at the probate registry where you are based. 
So the copy that is taken to the probate registry, it's called lodgment of will, um, is sealed. There's a red wax, this um, olden days wax, um, like those ones the kings used to seal documents. It's sealed and then put in a vault in Lagos State, and I'm sure in other states um, within the country too. So upon demise, right, that copy, um, the lawyer or trustee, whoever written your will, ought to have a copy and then goes to inform them at the probate registry for his, something called will reading. So they bring out the will that was lodged and then that is when, excuse me, <coughs> the seal is broken. Upon breaking that seal, please give me a few minutes, sorry, I'm coughing. Apologies. Sorry, sorry. 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 So sorry about that. Thank you. I can assure you that it's not COVID. Hmm. That being said. <laughs> because we are sharing your vaccine. I'm fully vaccinated. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> that being said. Yes. Yeah, so upon a um, real reading, that is when <clears throat> the, the, the seal is broken. So what is lodged and what the lawyer has ought to tally. Right? In the event that, <coughs> excuse me once again, <clears throat> in the event that what is lodged and what the lawyer <clears throat> or what, what was found, some people keep their wills in their house. Um, some people keep a copy of their will with the bank. <clears throat> different people keep it dif different places. But what, whatever you are bringing and what is lodged ought to tally. Now, um, I I'm not familiar with any incidents where they haven't tallied, but in the event that someone went to do something funny somewhere and then came back and said, oh, um, <clears throat> this will is what this person said and doesn't tally with what was lodged, unfortunately, if the will that is being brought um, supersedes, because one of the very first clauses you have on a will is that um, you're revoking every other will that has been, <clears throat> excuse me, that has been written. That was one of the very first clauses of reveal. Right. If the one that is being brought supersedes by date, the one that was lodged, then automatically the one that was that is being brought supersedes. Now, there are different ways to prove when, when the, <clears throat> to prove a test of reveal. That can that ha unfortunately has to be done in court. Cannot be done by the trustees or lawyers that wrote the bill for you. So forgery of reveal, however rare. It's still a possibility, but can be challenged in court. And if um, the court can then go through the process of proving the authenticity of a will that was not lodged. A will ought to be lodged, but sometimes some people don't lodge. Um, upon death, it's meant to lodge three months, at least three months, I think. The lack of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the lack of- Yeah, you are right, three months. Yes, yeah, three months. Yes, so three months. So a three months period is given to you to lodge after demise, as in beneficiaries that might find it somewhere to lodge after demise. But always lodge your will so that that issue of conflict of forgery does not arise. Because if it's lodged, whatever is lodged is the authentic, consider the authentic one. Only if what is brought as a new one was not lodged, and then you can unfortunately have to go through the court process to prove the authenticity of the new one that supersedes by date the one that was lodged. Yes. I All right. Thank you very Answer much. Question. Okay. Thank you. Very clear. All right. The next question goes to Dami Lola. Darling Ting is asking: Are any of these estate funds denominated in U.S. dollars to mitigate the effect of high inflation and devaluation? I'll take the question again. Absolutely. Oh, pardon me. Can it's I all right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So um, you're very correct. Uh, it's important. You know, I talked about the three phases of wealth management, the accumulation, the preservation, and the transfer. Of course, you don't want a situation where you are transferring worthless assets you know, to your beneficiaries. A lot of us have high aspirations. Many of us want our children to have the opportunity to school abroad in one way or the other. And you're going to be spending dollars, you know, uh, generally speaking, of course, for some it can be other currencies, but broadly speaking, you're going to spend foreign currency 
you know, to, to put your children through education, uh, international schooling. So it's important that if that is an objective for you, it's important that your, your, your estate, your assets are planned and you hold, you diversify in terms of the currency that you hold your assets in. So the beauty of you working with a, a firm like Meristem is that uh, beyond the Meristem trustees that takes care of the wealth transfer bid, we have a full uh, and robust wealth management service you know, that holds your hand all through all of this, takes a look at what your total assets are, how diversified are they, you know, what in terms of even the risk and the returns, are your assets properly matched? And then, of course, like you rightly mentioned, if your aspirations uh, require that you hold assets in certain currencies, we you know um, provide opportunities for you to um, buy into such assets so that indeed the value of those assets can be preserved. There are euro bonds that are uh, being issued both by the federal government of Nigeria and even the corporates. You can plug into that. We have dollar portfolios. We have um, assets. Um, uh, portfolios also in British funds. So uh, we have you covered very much so. So you can actually just send us an email, um, info at meristemng.com. We can put that email again on the um, chat room so that you can just shoot us an email and uh, we'll be able to specifically address your concerns. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Damilola. As Damilola said, we've got you covered in all currencies and in all asset classes. So I will be typing right now our email. Please feel free to reach us at trustees at meristemng.com for all questions you might have. And that said, there is a phone number that you can also reach. I will be pasting it shortly. Please keep your eyes on the chat box. Feel free to reach us either via email or by calling this phone number. Feel free, we'll be very ready Hello? to answer further questions. Yes, can you hear me? All right. So we'll answer all your questions and reply your emails. Can you reach out to us through these contacts? Okay, we'll rush through the remaining questions to see how much of them we can take before we begin to wrap up. All right, Odudwabasi is asking, okay, let me read everything Odudwabasi has written. He said, thanks for the insightful webinar. I think this goes to Bidolabo. My question is that in Nigeria, before one can retrieve money from insurance, trusts, dedicated funds, et cetera, it's very likely that they will go through legal hurdles and battles before they eventually have access to such funds. That access is not in any way guaranteed. So, what are your company safeguards to protect beneficiaries from such scenarios where they have to go to court before they receive their entitlements? If it's a lot more, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that question. Um, this is what I can um, say categorically, <clears throat> that you do not have to go through any stress whatsoever before your beneficiaries can lay claim to what is um, truly theirs. So if you've um, created a trust, and you've settled the trust with um, whatever property or estate, and you've um, specified who the beneficiaries are. Yes, the, your beneficiaries have access to their um, asset at any point in time, as long as um, it is as dictated as trust deed. So there is no challenge whatsoever. And um, beyond that is also the fact that um, when you have um, a trust deed, um, more often than not, we counsel our um, clients to nominate a protector. Right, so that in the event that you are no more, there's someone who can be your ears and eyes and can ensure that um, they can always play oversight function over what the trustee is doing. And also importantly is the fact that we play in, a, in an industry that is highly regulated. We are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And we know that um, if we are to do anything that runs contrary to your trust deed, we are the, we are the risk of penalty from our regulator. And beyond um, regulatory um, um, penalty is the fact that trust being, I mean, when you look at the word trust, right, it is something serious. And in a technical word, they say that a trustee owes a duty of fiduciary. That is a duty of utmost good faith. 
So it then means that if as a trustee, I shirk any of my responsibility or I renege on the promise, the solemn promise that I've made to, um, to a set law to make sure that the beneficiaries are well catered to, you can, you can take me to court. There is um, civil um, 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 liability for me and even criminal liability, do you understand? So, and um, also importantly, you know, beyond all of this, beyond the fact that um, our, our regulators, our watchdog, beyond the fact that um, you, have, you can have recourse to court, it's also the fact that at Meristem trustees, corporate governance is also very key, right? So we have esteemed people on our board um, um, beyond the executive directors, we have independent um, directors or non-executive directors who also ensure that we play um, um, by the book. So you have nothing to worry about, uh, both from an internal perspective or external perspective and all of that. Your, your needs are well catered to even when, when you are no more. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ibidola. Well, that is very clear and it answers the question in detail. Okay, the next question goes to Damilola. While Ibita Labo and Felicia help us to provide um, written answers to other questions in the QA chat box to enable us to attend to everyone. Okay, Dami Lola, another attendee is asking how much do these services cost? Will writing and putting a trust in place? Okay, so um, it, uh, we have sign-on fees uh, and then we have one-off fees. So for the, the, the task of writing your will is a one-off exercise, which um, it entails us um, sitting with you to understand what your assets are, um, what your family situation is. We draft the will, we lodge the will on your behalf, we hold a copy of the will, you know, and then that just ends it. So for that, that's what we call the comprehensive will writing. Uh, it's a one-off fee of 250,000 Naira, one-off flat. We also recognize that some people are at uh, the early stage of wealth accumulation, you know, and um, they haven't put together so much assets, but they do have um, assets that mean something to them. So your pension fund, I hope you know that your retirement savings account uh, does not automatically go to your next of kin or whatever. Uh, you still have to take care of it within your plan, your, your estate plan. So you have to, at the minimum, include it in your will. We understand that. So for people who have just their retirement savings accounts, cash in banks, so it's just near cash assets, nothing um, significant, nothing comprehensive. We have uh, a simple approach to writing a will. We call that the simple will service, and that is um, between 75,000 and 100,000. If you want us to lodge it, if you don't want us to lodge it, 75,000, if you want us to lodge it, it's 100,000. Know? So um, that's discounted um, for you. So that's pretty much for that. There are other things that uh, that you may, other services you may want us to provide. So in writing a will, recall I mentioned something about appointing executors. Uh, you may want to appoint uh, a corporate trustee, like Marisem trustees as your executors, executors to your will. So you know that that will only happen uh, upon demise and it would be for a, a certain period, typically one year to two years, just for the executor to help the family you know, navigate the, the, the stormy waters of um, going through probate and um, you know, administering the estate. So for that period, there's a fee that will be charged. Um, so we, that is dependent on the value of the assets that you're putting in the will. And so that can be agreed on one-on-one um, -on -one when we understand the nature of what you have. For trust services, uh, we have what we call sign-on fees. So uh, we sit with you, put together the documentation and uh, draft what we call a trust deed that is properly executed and also stamped and filed. You know, so to do that is a sign-on fee, one off of 250,000 Naira to, to, to do that. And then if um, subsequently, because we are holding the assets in trust for you, and of course your assets will not be idle, they will be held in trust trust and properly manage um, so that you can also continue to accrue interest and, and returns generally. 
your assets can grow and you can also have capital appreciation. So the management of the assets held in trust, we take a fee on that on an annual basis. Most of the time, we allow the clients to choose between paying a fixed fee, you know, which can be uh, 1% of the value of the asset. It can be a fixed flat fee if the assets are not income generating assets. And it can also be a share of income on the assets that we are holding in trust for you. So we are very flexible. So let me give an example. We are holding assets of 200 million worth in trust for you. Maybe they consist of shares of companies and you earn dividends on those companies, or they consist of bonds, you earn coupons on that, or real estate and you earn rent on that. We do not charge you management fees on the value of the assets because we do not want your the value of your assets you know, um, to be uh, tampered with. We base our management fee, our annual management fee, on a percentage of the income that you earn on the asset. And of course, uh, this creates a win-win. So when you don't earn on your assets, we also don't earn uh, our fees. So, uh, but we can always discuss in further details if, um, if we, you let us know what your specific uh, situation is. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dami Lola, for a detailed breakdown of the fees that apply. All right. For you to get more information for Mary's Test Trustees Limited, please check the chat box. Our email is there. Our contact phone number is also there. As we begin to wrap up, I'll remind us of the words of Pablo Picasso. He said, only put off until tomorrow what you're willing to die having left undone. I'll take it again. Only put off until tomorrow what you are willing to die having left undone. That said, remember to click the link in the chat box to fill out your survey, telling us how you'd like us to help you plan your estate. Feel free to share your phone number and email with us via the link. All right, at this point, I'll be calling on our host, Dami Lola Hassan, the Managing Director of Merisem Trustees Limited, for the closing remarks. Damilola, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. To the almost uh, 150 something people that we have had on this call um, this evening. Thank you um, for making our time to listen to us. We know that um, it has been a useful um, discussion. We also believe that beyond this conversation that we've had, you would reach out to us. Uh, we want to understand what your situation is. We want to work with you. We want to help you um, navigate this terrain of planning your estate. We understand that you need a professional um, to do this with you. And we're very much available you know, to handhold you through the process. Our fees are flexible, our service is great. Allow me to blow our trumpets, you know, that way. But more importantly, you need to plan your estate. No one is going to do it for you. However, if you do not plan it, someone will do it. It could be the court, it could be, you know, professionals who are now stepping, you know, to take decisions on your behalf. Nobody is going to really know what is it important to you because you haven't uh, stopped to document those important things. So I want to encourage you, we have shared links on uh, the chat room. For everyone that has registered for this webinar, you will get emails from us. We'll send you a, a questionnaire that you can fill that would you know, further help you to put your thoughts together, to put details of your assets together and we can work with that to advise you on what we think the best asset planning tools you should combine, you know, uh, so that you can actually achieve um, your overall objectives. I want to say thank you very much once again. And uh, we will also share the recorded session of this webinar. Please be on the lookout for it. Uh, don't forget, we have just a phone call and an email away. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. All right, thank you very much, Damilola, for the amazing closing remarks.
For everyone who has attended this webinar, feel free to let us know how you feel about this webinar in the chat box. Even as we play the Mary Stem advert to let you know more about Mary Stem, feel free to chat away. We'll stay here for another maybe five minutes or more before we call it a day. All right. Enjoy the video. Thank you. Thank you, you stars. Now let's see you conquer galaxies. You've gone for gold. Let's show you two more treasure chests. And Your story doesn't have to end with you. As a matter of fact, it can continue into the next generation. The only way to move is up the way to go. And the generation after that. After all, you've worked hard to get to where you are. Why should your wealth end with you? Let your story continue. Let's take you Let's grow wealth for you. You've reached the stars. Now let's see you conquer galaxies. You've gone for gold. Let's show you two more treasure chests. Your story doesn't have to end with you. As a matter of fact, it can continue into the next generation. The only way to move is up the way to go. And the generation after that. Don't stop. After all, you've worked hard to get to where you are. Why should your wealth end with you? Let your story continue. Let's take you Let's grow wealth for you. You've reached the stars. Now let's see you conquer galaxies. You've gone for gold. Let's show you two more treasure chests. Your story doesn't have to end with you. As a matter of fact, it can continue into the next generation. generation after that don't stop after all you've worked hard to get to why should your wealth end with you let your story continue let's take you medicine let's grow wealth for you everyone all right goodbye everyone have a beautiful evening bye Bye. <laughs> Bye.